Just last week, Qatar Airways has once again been named the Airline of the Year by Skytrax, taking the top spot for a fifth time in the past 10 years alone. However, there has been a ton of controversy around Skytrax as a company and the validity of their ratings. After all, one of their main sources of revenue is the sale of consulting services to airlines, something that could very well be considered a conflict of interest because it means that Skytrax generates its revenue from the exact companies it claims to independently rate. For my part, I do not consider their awards useful, nor particularly trustworthy. To be honest, I'd say that most flight reviewers here on YouTube are more trustworthy and transparent than they are. So if you want real, unbiased information about what airlines are like, you are at the right place already. Make sure you subscribe to these guys, but also make sure you subscribe to our channel for straightforward, no-nonsense reviews of as many different airlines as possible. Today, we'll take a look at Qatar Airways' admittedly fantastic economy class, its few disappointing shortcomings and the reasons why I just wouldn't call Qatar Airways the world's best airline. Aviation geeks and frequent flyers, welcome to this new episode of our review series Brutally Honest, where we take you along different airlines, mainly in economy class, to give you first-hand impressions of what they're really like. Today I'm heading from my hometown of Vienna through Doha to Bangkok on Qatar Airways, with the first flight being operated by an Airbus A330-300, followed by a flight on their 777-300ER. You might be surprised to see the A330 still in operation at Qatar Airways. They are fairly old, with cabins that have never been refurbished and they were supposed to be retired right now, but these planes have to complement Qatar Airways fleet at the moment due to Qatar's incredibly odd dispute with European aircraft manufacturer Airbus. Qatar Airways claims there is something wrong with the paint of their Airbus A350s and demands concessions from Airbus for it. The Aviation Authority of Qatar has even officially grounded the planes in question, which is why few A350-900s are currently in service at Qatar Airways and the A330s have to help out. But the odd thing about this dispute is that no other airline in the world has come forward with this problem the way Qatar has. Qatar Airways is completely alone with their accusations and public demands for action by Airbus, putting into question the validity and the motive of bringing them to light. Do they want discounts on future airplane purchases? Some kind of leverage? Simply a lot of cash? Or an excuse to cancel outstanding orders? Well, Airbus made that last decision for Qatar Airways already, flat out cancelling all of Qatar's outstanding orders, not just for the A350s, but also the A321neos. An unprecedented move by an aircraft manufacturer. And regardless of who's right, this has real consequences for passenger comfort as the A330s simply don't measure up to their newer A350s. But enough rambling about that already, let's just start the trip and see what they're like. Of course, I just had to choose the first day of summer break to leave Vienna. The airport is packed, but fortunately Vienna airport managed the pandemic quite well, not firing any employees, so while it's busy, the airport is able to handle the masses. Qatar Airways currently uses Terminal 3 at Vienna Airport. Due to upcoming renovations, the terminal they were in before, Concourse D, is operationally complex to use at the moment, which is why a handful of major carriers were moved to the newer Terminal 3, which is where Austrian Airlines is based as well. For passengers, the difference isn't that big. The view from here is a lot better though, and down there you can already see our ride to Doha, A7AEO, a 2008 built Airbus A330-300. We're parked right next to one of Austrian's 777s, which is about to depart to Tokyo Narita. We've actually covered the re-inaugural flight of Austrian to Tokyo on our channel when they resumed the route back in 2018, so check out that video as well if you're interested. Since Qatar never intended their A330s to be in operation for so long, the cabin is a bit outdated by now. The business class cabin, which you won't get to see when boarding through door 2, still features a 222 configuration. An economy class comes in the standard A330 configuration, which all full-service carriers have, Hello. 8 seats per row in a 242 pattern. There are 275 economy class seats on this plane and 30 in business class, bringing the total to 305. As a point of comparison, that's slightly more than most full-service carriers. Delta standard configuration is 282 seats, 
Qantas has 297, Swiss only has 236, and Korean Air has up to 284, meaning that Qatar is on the upper end of seat counts of major airlines A330-300s. They don't have the most seats though. Cathay Pacific and Aer Lingus both have configurations that go up to 317 while still maintaining a comfortable cabin. Well, and then there are low-cost carriers like Cebu Pacific that just obliterate everyone with their 436 all-economy configurations, but I digress. My seat for the next 5 hours will be 35A. Waiting on the seat already are headphones, a hygiene kit, a pillow, as well as a blanket. The seat itself is in a really good condition considering how old it is, and it also comes with an adjustable headrest. But what in the world is this? Many older planes have such boxes beneath their seats, this is where the old large hardware of the in-flight entertainment system used to go, but I have never seen one that's that big. Usually they look more like this for example. All window seats appear to have one of these, so while you get the view, you lose quite a bit of space for your feet. At least the legroom doesn't disappoint, but how do they expect people to sit with this? While we're focused on what's beneath the seats already, here's something that isn't. Power ports. Qatar's A330s do not offer universal power outlets, which honestly from the world's best airline I would expect all twin aisle planes to have. The main hint as to the age of the seat is actually the entertainment screen, particularly its size, just around double the size of a contemporary smartphone. The seat also doesn't offer USB ports, meaning there's no way to charge anything, a major downside of this plane. At least you got a little cup holder on the back of the tray table I guess. In the armrest you may find a remote control for the in-flight entertainment system, and on the inside of it, the audio port. I've said it before and I'll say it again, that's the worst possible place for an audio port, right here, because the audio jack will constantly press against your leg the entire flight. You got to be fair to Qatar Airways here, these planes were not supposed to be in operation anymore, but their dispute with Airbus seems like it could have been avoided, meaning that some of the blame for this old cabin to still be used does fall on Qatar's shoulders. For now, it's time to make our way to Doha. After climbing out of Vienna and passing over Bratislava, it's time for lunch. This is where Qatar Airways shines. Their meals are just meticulously designed. The dark tray, the transparent containers for the sides and the garnishes, this meal just looks very, very appetizing. For the main course I went with a chicken curry with rice topped with black sesame. This was served alongside a piece of warm bread, and on the side you'll find some pesto cream with cherry tomatoes and mozzarella as well as some chocolate mousse and vanilla cream topped with cake crumbles for dessert. A bottle of water was provided with the meal as well, and the beverage of your choice where I went with a can of beer. Kata Airways also provides metal cutlery in economy class, something I appreciate a lot as it gives the meal a more elegant feel. All in all, this is a phenomenal meal service, beautifully presented and very tasty. The only tiny thing that comes to mind, some airlines, including their main competitor Emirates, offer cheese and crackers with their meals, something I do appreciate a lot and I did notice was absent here, but considering how good the meal was overall, it's silly to even complain about that. The hygiene kit I mentioned before includes a fresh face mask, some hand sanitizer, and a pair of latex gloves. And while we're at it, this is what the headphones look like. Qatar Airways is known for offering one of the world's best in-flight entertainment systems, and even though the hardware is dated, the selection of movies and TV shows to watch on demand is still excellent. As a pre-landing service, some more beverages were offered alongside a little snack. I went with a can of club soda and some sour cream pretzels. 
Before we start our descent, I wanted to capture the cabin once more, also for our Instagram story. You should follow us on Instagram, as we post live stories of all of our flights there. I also wanted to take a look at the lavatory, and even though it was clean, as I came out with a camera, a flight attendant walked up to me and demanded me to delete the clip of the lavatory immediately. This was very odd, and I have not experienced anything like this ever before in any of the 300 plus reviews I've made. Only the clip of the laboratory was a problem, not my filming in general. The reason? It wasn't meticulously clean, and it might reflect badly on the crew. I didn't get the feeling that it wasn't clean, but the purser demanded, he cleaned the bathroom for me, and then I could take another shot of it, which you see now. This moment, more than any I've had with Qatar, underlines one of the fundamental problems I see with the airline. In order to have staff perform at their very best, you need a motivator. For an airline like Singapore Airlines or Emirates, that motivator is the pride in the brand, supported by the airline through a good relationship with its staff. Qatar Airways, on the other hand, seems to have set on fear as their motivator. Fear of reprisal if anything happens that reflects badly on the brand. Qatar Airways has faced many accusations over the years over how it treats its staff, but this flight review is no place to thoroughly address all of these issues right now. My interaction with this visibly worried cabin crew member, however, seems to be a symptom of this problem. Now it's time to get back to our seat, as we are about to start our approach into Doha. arrived perfectly on time at Hamad Airport, which will be my home for the next 10 hours. The itinerary with a short connection was just too expensive, so I went with the overnight layover instead. This is only my second time transiting at Hamad Airport after my trip from Los Angeles via Doha to Dubai last year, which I have covered in another episode of Brutally Honest. And to be brutally honest here, this airport kind of sucks. Don't let the beautiful architecture fool you, Hamad Airport is surprisingly poorly planned. Multiple times has the signage been terribly confusing, ending in hallways that were just closed off, way too little seating and extremely crowded, and the Wi-Fi was just awful. It was very slow, constantly disconnecting me, and on top of that, there were only three ways to log into it. You either scan your boarding pass, WhatsApp, or you enter your Kata Airways confirmation code. Do you see a problem with this? If you don't have WhatsApp, and you don't fly on Kata Airways, how would you log a laptop without a camera into the Wi-Fi? Honestly, who, who thought of this? Again, to be fair here, the airport is efficient, even though it's crowded, wait times at security or transfer desks was minimal, but everything else was just a letdown. I was able to spend the night at the South Wing Lounge, a super crowded off-brand business class lounge Qatar Airways puts frequent flyers in, so that their higher quality Al Murjan lounge is quiet and tranquil for their business class passengers that paid the full price. I don't know any other One World member airline that created a worse business class lounge just for its frequent flyers into which they ban them when they only fly in economy class. But of the entire transit experience, what annoyed me the most was the boarding. At Hamad Airport, they scan your ticket and then put you into a closed off waiting area. This is also why the airport doesn't have enough seating. Most of it is behind glass walls, only accessible after scanning the ticket. And scanning the ticket is only possible from around an hour before boarding when the gate desk is staffed. And after entering, you can't leave this area anymore. On top of that, it's too small, there aren't enough seats for everyone, some people just had to sit on the floor. And this was especially egregious as our flight ended up boarding more than an hour and a half late, meaning everyone was trapped in here without access to bathrooms or water fountains. I honestly failed to see the reasoning behind such closed off gate areas. 
Some airports have them because they do security checks right at the gate, but they don't do that in Doha. It's just a ticket scanning. And Doha isn't the only major airport that has gate areas like this. They also have them in Dubai and Bangkok's Suvarnabhumi Airport. But at least there, the seating areas are bigger and they have restrooms. Due to the limited space, boarding was unsurprisingly very chaotic as well because everything was just so narrow and crowded, there is no physical separation between boarding groups possible like it is in Dubai. And it was just a free-for-all. Nobody obeyed the group calls. Everyone just pushed towards the one door, overwhelming the staff there. And you know who named this airport the best in the world? Our friends at Skytrax. What a load of BS. Finally, having been able to escape this madness, we have made it aboard one of Qatar Airways Boeing 777-300ERs. This particular one is registered A7BAI and was built in 2008, the same year as our A330, showcasing what a difference a refurbished cabin can make on a 14-year-old plane. Pretty wild that 2008 is already 14 years ago. This particular configuration has two business class sections, totaling 42 of Qatar's famous Q-suites. If you want to know what they're like, check out the fantastic review by fellow air travel blogger, The Vicarious Voyager. Behind that, you will find 312 economy class seats in a 343 configuration. I personally don't mind 777s with 10 seats per row, but some people almost religiously try to avoid them. My seat for the next seven hours will be 33K. The same items as on the previous flight are waiting on it already, headphones, a hygiene kit, a pillow, and a blanket. The headrests are also adjustable again, both vertically as well as on the sides. The legroom is excellent, and the seat back pocket has these little extra pockets which I always find super useful for stuff like your phone or water bottles. This time you'll find both universal power outlets beneath the seats and USB ports up here, in addition to audio ports and the ethernet port, the latter I don't think has a function anymore. Again, you will find a remote control and a personal in-flight entertainment screen with the vast selection of Qatar's Oryx One entertainment system. The seat also has a tray table, which can be used half opened or fully opened, perfect to show you the same headphones and hygiene kit as before. With that, we're now finally ready for departure. After takeoff, the crew once again directly began the meal service. On longer flights like this one, I would certainly appreciate a little beverage service with a small snack before the meal, but again the meal quality itself made up for this negligible shortcoming. For the main course, I went with a Thai fried fish curry and rice, which was served alongside this creamy dessert, a mango and cardamom pyrene, as well as some fresh fruit. To drink, I went with a cup of coffee, and again there was a bottle of water and a warm bread roll provided with the meal. While I have complained a lot about Qatar on this trip already, you can be confident in their meal quality. You'll be well fed on Qatar Airways.
most of this flight I spent sleeping, as it was too noisy to do so in the crowded lounge at Hammett Airport, but I woke up just in time for the pre-landing snack, which was this warm savory pasty, a potato bhaji, served alongside a beverage of your choice. After that, tea and coffee were offered, along with some Austrian candy. What a coincidence to get candy that's produced in the city I live in on the flight from Qatar to Thailand. Qatar Airways 777s are also equipped with Wi-Fi, which you can use for a $10 flat fee. The 777 offers the same high-quality entertainment system as the A330, albeit with bigger screens and more modern hardware, making the software run more smoothly. As we are approaching Bangkok, reflecting on this journey, I must admit that this trip was a bit disappointing. Most of the things I mentioned during the flight could potentially be labeled as pedantic fault-finding, but when it comes to an airline and an airport which constantly parade their accolades, they deserve to be held accountable for their shortcomings. Obviously, the A330s shouldn't be part of Qatar's fleet anymore with this kind of cabin, which their dispute with Airbus is to blame for. What really disappointed me was Hamad Airport. I do not see any argument beyond maybe the architectural quality that would qualify this to be named the world's best airport. The Wi-Fi was awful, the airport was too crowded, there was too little seating, a lounge that was subpar, misleading signage and a boarding process so chaotic, almost resembling passengers trying to escape the terminal like they would a sinking ship. I'm rarely that vocal about the downsides of a trip, but knowing that Qatar can be amazing if they tried makes this trip especially disappointing. The crew, actually all of the staff from passenger service agent to lounge attendants to the flight crews were professional and friendly. The meals were amazing, the newer cabin of the 777 is also really good. It's the older planes that Qatar Airways is forced to use due to its silly dispute with Airbus and the many shortcomings of Hamad Airport that tainted the overall impression. In a recent episode of Brutally Honest, I said that Emirates is worth paying a bit extra for, worth choosing even if they're not the cheapest option. After this trip, I'm not sure if I would say the same thing about Qatar Airways. Qatar is certainly one of the better options out there, but I just don't feel like they're the best. And that might actually be something that I agree on with Skytrax, because you know who won the award for the overall best economy class product? Emirates! And while you could have hour-long arguments over whether it's the world's best economy class, to me it's arguably better than Qatar Airways economy class though. But don't let this video discourage you from booking flights with them. There are still so many good things about Qatar Airways, the crews, the food, on their newer planes, also the cabin. But I just wanted to level your opinion a little bit in case all you heard so far is that they're the world's best. Because they're not. If they're among the cheaper options, absolutely go for it. But if you want to pay a premium for a really good product, then maybe try to find a flight on Emirates. With that, thank you very much for watching this video and coming along on this trip. If I was able to help you, entertain you, answer a question, or simply give you an authentic first-hand impression of Thank the trip, you, please consider to support our mission to gather no-nonsense first-hand reviews of as many different airlines as possible by subscribing to our channel. If you really believe in our mission and have the means to do so, please consider becoming a paid channel member like all of these amazing people have already decided to do. With your support, we can further improve the variety of airlines covered, our video quality, and make sure to reserve the best window seats on the plane for the best views, and of course, keep our channel free of bogus VPN sponsorships. Thank you to everyone who has supported us already, and all of you for watching this video until the end. I'll see you again next week for a new episode of Brutally Honest, and until then, thanks for watching, and have a great rest of your day.